What is up, Church by the Glades? And I want to right now welcome all of our campuses and wish all the men in our campuses a happy man weekend. So I want all the men to stand as all the ladies make a bunch of noise and the brothers celebrate the brothers at Dade CI. I want all the men to stand at Lake Worth. Come on, make some noise. Lake Worth, come on. Downtown Fort Lauderdale, Sample Road. What's up, ladies at Homestead? Come on, give it up for the men right now. Go. Come on, man, make some noise for your brothers. Go, brother, come on. Happy Man Weekend. You can be seated. Thank you for being here. I know a lot of guys take this weekend and just go golfing, go fishing, just sit on the couch. I hope you do some of that. But you've led the people you love to the house of God, and you are the man. You are the man. Hey, so this is going to be a fun weekend. I can't wait to see what God's going to do to all of our campuses this weekend. But then, again, right around the corner, uh, God and Country, the weekend before the 4th of July. If you've not been to that service at Church by the Glades, we're a passionately patriotic congregation. I know we come from all over the world, but you do life right now in the most blessed country on the face of the planet. And we want to celebrate America. If you've not been here for that service, creativity-wise, inspiration-wise, it's one of the coolest things that we do all year long. And it's a slam dunk, easy invite for someone. Uh, I mean, who doesn't want to come on that, the, that weekend before 4th of July and celebrate this great nation? It is really one of those compelling, powerful, inspiring, and fun services we ever do. So please grab these cards, invite friends, family, neighbors, co-workers, be the man, be the woman. Don't miss this opportunity. God and country coming up in just a couple weeks, couple weeks. Listen, I'm excited to speak to you guys. Next week, I'm back next week. I've had a couple weeks to take a, a break, and I, I appreciate that time. But anytime I don't speak, I always bring in somebody, somebody who can knock it out of the park. And uh, I've been so looking forward to the return of our guest speaker today. Uh, this guy is a world-class communicator. He's in high demand. He literally speaks all over the country. His schedule is so busy. He pastors one of the largest churches in America. They have campuses in multiple states and multiple hemispheres. They have a campus of Central Church in Australia. They have campuses in Florida. They have campuses in Arizona. Uh, they have a bunch of campuses around Las Vegas. And one thing I love about this pastor, if you've ever been to Vegas, maybe the one city crazier than South Florida. And so he understands us and our unique cultural dynamics. He is a dear friend, a great man of God. His lovely wife, Lori, is here with him today. But I want to welcome the man today. So Church by the Glades and all of our campuses, would you stand up and celebrate the one and the only Judd Wilhite from Central Church in Vegas, my friend. Awkward man hug. Come on, make a little noise. Oh, wow, I'm at Church by the Glades! And it's Father's Day weekend. How great is that, man? What a joy and honor to be here with you. You guys gotta know this is like one of my favorite places on the planet to speak and to be and to worship. It always is. It's such a joy. And I know every guest speaker gets up here and says the same thing. We love your pastor, David, and his amazing wife, Lisa, and their kids. But it's just true, man. One of the greatest fathers I have ever been around on Father's Day. That's a fact. The greatest fathers. We're the greatest leaders. Now, I learned something just in a casual conversation kind of moment, and uh, I didn't tell anybody I was going to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Get your phones out. Everybody get your phones out and uh, open up your calendars, and let's go to November. Open up your calendars and move forward to November here for me, and let's pick November 20th because I'm not sure of the exact day, but it's around November 20th is your pastor David Hughes' 20-year anniversary as the pastor of Church by the Glades. He would hate that I just did this. 20 years. Everybody just mark it down on your calendar. We're going to celebrate some awesome years of ministry in November. 20 years. Now, let me tell you why that's so huge. Most pastors barely last three, four years at a location. 
It's very rare for a pastor to stay faithful through all the ups and downs, all the difficulties, the good times and the bad that a community goes through, and to be faithful and in a place with integrity, without scandal, with uh, a heart for God for over 20 years. That's a big, big, big deal. Big deal. Good job, Pastor David Hughes. Come on, man. Yes. Amazing. Amazing, amazing. So uh, you guys need to throw a big party this next November for 20 years for Pastor Dave and Lisa. It's going to be awesome. Well, hey, I am thrilled and honored to be here with you, honored uh, that it's Father's Day weekend, and I want to talk to you a little bit about how you can be blessed in your life. How many of you would like to be blessed? (laughs) I mean, that's like every hand in the room, right? Like, yeah, even if you don't know what that word means, you're like, it sounds pretty good. I think I want that. Now, now, blessed is kind of a religious word. We sort of use it in some different contexts in our culture. When I think about it, I think one of the most common ways we use the word blessed or blessed is when somebody sneezes. Right? Somebody sneezes. What, what are you supposed to say? Bless you. bless you. That's right. Now, I didn't know this because I came from a home that didn't really say bless you when somebody sneezed. We got the disinfectant and got out of the room. That's what we did when somebody sneezed because we don't want to get sick. But my wife came from a family where they always said, bless you, when somebody sneezed. And so we started dating. I remember we're sitting there, and she sneezed. And not once, not twice, but three or four times because that's how she sneezes. How many of you, when you sneeze, you sneeze more than once? You know what I'm talking about? It's always a multiple sneeze, right? The machine gun sneeze. So she sneezes multiple times, and I remember I'm sitting there, and she looks at me, and I can tell she's getting annoyed, and, and, I, and I said, what? And she said, aren't you going to say bless you? I said, no, wasn't going to say bless you, and she says, you need you, she says, look, when you say bless you, when somebody sneezes, that communicates love and concern and compassion and empathy, it shows that you're about more than yourself, you're tuned into their needs, you say, and I'm like, you get all that from bless you? She says, it's very important to me. So listen, we've been married over 20 years, and I learned a long time ago in marriage, you can be right or you can be happy, but you can't be both. And so when she sneezes now, you know what I say? Bless you. And I bless every one of them. Boom, bless you. Boom, bless you. Boom, bless you. Just so make sure she heard it, right? I'm I'm in the clear. I'm good. She'll do a drive-by blessing on people, too. We'll be at a restaurant, and they're sitting there like four tables back, and some random stranger sneezes, and Lori's like, bless you! (laughs) Everybody gets a bless you if you're around around Lori. So that's probably the most common way we use uh, the term um, bless or blessed or blessing. Uh, Now, we will, like Thanksgiving, people say, gather around the table, somebody say the blessing. Right? Somebody say the blessing. Say the prayer. My mother was from the South, and so she would always say, bless your heart. Right, which in the South is code for you're not so smart. (laughs) Think about it, right? Like, oh, look at you. Oh, look at you. Bless your little heart. You're kind of stupid, aren't you? Bless your heart. So that's how she would throw it around, right? Bless your, bless your heart. And then we use the hashtag, blessed, right? You see that around everywhere. People are blessed. You know, we see it for all kinds of things. It's like, check out my new Mercedes, blessed, right? You know, I got a raise, blessed. You know, I'm, uh, my, my job's going well, blessed. Look at my hot date, blessed. Right? And, and even simple things. I remember um, a guy once is like, you know, my bread fell off the table and I caught it before it hit the ground. Hashtag blessed. Okay, but what does it mean from a biblical perspective to say that we're blessed? Like, what does the word bless mean? Well, the word bless fundamentally means that you have God's divine favor working in your life. To be blessed is to have God's divine favor working working in your life. Now, there's a certain level in which we would all say we're blessed. I mean, you're blessed, I'm blessed, we're here, we're alive, we're breathing air, Uh, we were able to, you know, come to church, we're able to to gather together, we're able to worship, we're able to go to work, we're able to at least have enough health to do the basic things that that we need to do in our life. There's a whole lot of things that that we've been blessed with, and we would say we're we're blessed in our lives. Uh, From a spiritual standpoint, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have, um, through faith in Christ, the forgiveness of your sins. You have the hope of eternal life. You have God's spirit that dwells within you, right? You have spiritual gifts that God has given you. Those are all blessings. So we're all already blessed. In fact, turn to the person next to you and just say, I'm blessed. 
I'm blessed. I'm blessed. But how many of us wouldn't mind being even more blessed? Come on, I'm just saying. Like, like we're already blessed, I get it, but most of us would be like, if you're like me, you're like, well, yeah, I'll take some more of that. I'll take some more of that. Now, a lot of people, when it comes to being blessed, they want to be blessed on their terms, right? They want to be blessed on their terms. They want to be out partying. I'm doing my thing. I'm clubbing. I'm partying. And God, bless me. Bless me with that hot girl right over there. God, bless me with that cute guy right over there. God, bless me with a little more money. Bless me with Kanye tickets. God, bless me. Bless me, right? Bless me with a, with a, with a, with a, with a better job. Bless me. And we, we got all these, and we want God to bless us kind of on our terms. And that's, I get it, but that's a pretty shallow perspective on God's blessing and what it can mean for us in our lives. And I want to suggest to you today that God does not simply want to partially bless your old life. He wants to bless you with a whole new kind of life. One that's God empowered, God purpose. God doesn't just want to partially bless your old life. He wants to bless you with a whole new kind of life today. And I want to talk to you about how we can receive that kind of blessing and grow in it and walk in it. About things that we can do this Father's Day weekend to position ourselves to be even more blessed by God. So if you want to follow along in your Bibles, we'll bring us up on the screen. We're going to be in John chapter 3 today. We're going to look at an encounter Jesus has with a guy named Nicodemus. John chapter 3. And uh, so we're going to bring uh, this verse up on the screen. John chapter 3, beginning of verse 1. And when we get to the highlighted word, I'm going to ask you to read it out loud with me in Pastor David Hughes fashion. So here we go. All right, it says, John chapter 3, 1. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. That's a Jewish religious leading class. It says, after dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. So your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Now, Nicodemus was a heavy hitter in the day. In fact, you would say Nicodemus was sort of a mix of, if you can imagine, a senator who's also a Harvard professor, who's also a pastor. That's kind of Nicodemus. In fact, this is probably the most competent, accomplished person that Jesus has spoken to at this point in his ministry. Nicodemus comes to him at night alone, probably because he didn't want to be seen approaching Jesus, right? He didn't want to mess his reputation up, right? So he comes at night alone. He slips in. But here's what I think is cool about Nicodemus. Nicodemus, even though he's wealthy, he's powerful, he's already got the degrees, he's accomplished, he was known as the teacher of Israel, he's already the man, he's still open to what God is doing in this guy who doesn't have the degrees, doesn't have the pedigree, doesn't have all the background, and he comes because he's hungry and he's seeking. Nicodemus still is spiritually hungry in his life, even though he's already been blessed. So if we want to be on the road to even greater blessing, this Father's Day, if you want to position yourself like I do to be blessed even more, one of the principles we learn immediately from Nicodemus' life is this, to simply stay hungry. To stay hungry. Now, I know the World Cup's going on. I know we got some World Cup fans. Uh, now, I, now, hey, we, we had a hockey team in Las Vegas, and uh, we, they went all the way to the Stanley Cup Finals. And I know hockey in the desert is like, what are you smoking? But it was pandemonium, man. You know, our, our city embraced that team like crazy. It was an amazing year. It was uh, incredible. I got to a couple of the finals games. They were remarkable. We lost. But anyway, um, it was a incredible experience. But now that that's passed, I'm already looking forward to football season. Anybody looking forward to football season? Come on, dads. You know what I'm talking about? Football season? Now, don't hold it against me. My father was a Cowboys fan. I was raised on the Cowboys, and so I don't really have a choice in this matter. You know, it's Father's Day. I want to honor my parents, all that. I don't want my, my father who's passed on to turn over in his grave or anything. So I've been a Cowboys fan my whole life, right? Now, the Cowboys have not won more than two playoff games in over 20 years. It's been a long, long winter of our discontent. And so I went on Google recently, and I Googled Ezekiel Elliott, which is our star running back, off-season workout. Because I want to know, like, what's Ezekiel doing in the off-season? 
He came in a little heavy last year. He didn't have that good of a year last year. We just got rid of one of our star receivers this year. All we got left is the run game, people. Ezekiel Elliott offseason, you know what I found? I found this raunchy, raw YouTube video, and it said Ezekiel Elliott working out in the offseason, and he's doing leg presses, and he's like, ah, ah, and then it says Zeke is hungry, and I'm like, yeah, baby. (laughs) Zeke is hungry, because here's what I know. Listen, listen, here's what I know. How you prepare in the offseason has everything to do with how you play in season. Come on, right? Come on, you athletes, you student athletes. How you prepare in the off season has everything to do with how well you play in season. So it's going to be a good year if Zeke stays healthy because Zeke's been hungry in the off season, and that's going to help shape how he handles when the, the, the trouble that comes in season. And I think the same is true for us spiritually. A lot of us in our lives, when things are going bad, we cry out to God. When things are hard, we show up at church. When we go through difficulty and crisis all of a sudden we, we we reach out to God and we open our heart to God and we make church a priority and that is awesome and that's exactly what we should do but listen 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 don't miss this if things are good in your life if you get some breathing room in your life if things are comfortable in your life you in that season should be just as intentional about staying hungry spiritually as you are in the hard season because listen listen How you prepare in the off season has everything to do with how you play in season. Listen, the habits that you maintain in the comfortable season will determine how well you handle the difficult season, right? The habits you maintain in the comfortable season will determine how well you handle the difficult season. And life is full of seasons for all of us. We have good seasons. We have hard seasons. We have seasons where some of you are in a good season right now. You actually, there's some breathing room. You don't have a financial boot on your neck. You know, like all of a sudden you got, you're, you're able to breathe a little bit. Things are settling down. In other words, God is blessing you right now in your life. You're in a season where God's blessing you in your life. But here's what happened in the Old Testament again and again. God begins to bless his people. God begins to pour out his goodness on his people. All of a sudden there's peace in the land. All of a sudden there's peace in their homes. God's doing a work in their lives. And what happened? They got comfortable and then they took their eyes off of God and they just started to subtly and slowly drift. And it took more difficulty and testing to bring them back. So if you're in a, if you're in a good season right now, that's awesome. It won't last. <laughs> but enjoy it, right? Celebrate it for what it is. Be grateful. But don't drift from God. Stay hungry. If you're, in a, if you're in a tough season right now, that's okay. We've all been there and we'll be there again. If it's a hard season right now, keep leaning into God. Stay hungry for God. Let him work in your heart. Let him do what only he can do. Some of you, you're being tested right now. You feel like you're being tested at work. You feel like you're being tested at marriage. You feel like you're being tested as a father. You feel like you've been tested because you come through something traumatic and horrible in your life and you're trying to get to the other side of it. It feels like you're being tested, but don't miss this. Look, where God tests us is often where he's preparing to bless us. Where God tests us is often where he is preparing to bless us. So stay hungry. One of my favorite verses is this verse from Jesus. Matthew chapter 7, beginning of verse 7. We'll bring it up on the screen. There's lots of highlighted words, so jump in here with me. Jesus says this. Keep on what? Asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Now, you could, you could twist this passage, and you could kind of make it say a lot of things that it doesn't, and at the same time, I would say, let's also not try to tone it down at a level where it also kind of dissolves away everything Jesus is actually saying. It's almost like Jesus is giving us permission to nag God a little bit. You see that? It could be translated like, ask and keep asking, knock and keep knocking, seek and keep seeking. Everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks not. Now, here's what I found in my own heart and life. My own life, if I ask and keep asking, ask and keep asking, what I eventually find is maybe God brings a breakthrough in that area of my life, or maybe God changes the desire of my heart because you realize that whatever you're asking for isn't as important as what God often does in your life while you're asking, right? Maybe God changes my heart, changes what I ultimately desire for, 
And, and that's the blessing, you know, that I receive in that life. But Jesus is saying it's okay to be persistent. It's like my son, my, uh, my 14-year-old. He, um, he loves tortellini. He came in one day and uh, he said, Dad, uh, his mom had been out of town and, and I, had, as a good dad, Father's Day, as a good dad, you know, I'd made tortellini for him the last two nights in a row. Mom was gone. He comes in, Dad, I want tortellini again. And I remember looking at him, I said, look, dude, I've made tortellini for you the last two nights in a row. I'm tired. It's been a long day. I don't want to cook. Come on, moms. I don't want to cook. You're on your own. No tortellini for you. He comes back in a little, you know, 20 minutes later. Come on, Dad. Make some tortellini for me. Please, tortellini, man. Just won't take, only take 20 minutes, you know. I'll even help you do the dishes. I'm like, no. I already told you. I'm not making tortellini. No tortellini tonight. Eat something else. Get a PB&J or something. You know, like, take care of yourself. He comes back in a little later. Same thing all over again. A little later, I'm sitting there. I'm like, nope, not going to do it. My phone starts ringing. I look down. I answer my phone. It's my son from the other room. And when I answer the phone, he says, tortellini. Tortellini. I'm like, dude, I'm not making tortellini for you. He comes crawling into the room on his hands and knees. Tortellini, tortellini. He lays out on the floor. Tortellini, tortellini. And I remember I finally said, all right, look, I stood up. I said, I'll make tortellini for you if you will never ask me for tortellini again. He said, I'll never ask you for tortellini again today. So, I made tortellini for him. But I think that's kind of what Jesus is getting. Like, we got to stay hungry for God. We got to keep seeking God. We got to keep going after him. And it's okay to be a little persistent because maybe there's some truth to that with God too. Look, my son wore me down. We're God's kids. Just keep seeking, keep asking, keep knocking. I don't know what you're praying for. I don't know what kind of miracle you're holding out for. Some of you are praying that God will, will give you a larger platform, greater influence, a bigger, he'll expand your reach at work or at your career, or, you know, with your, with your different contacts and sales that you're working. You're praying that God will open up more doors. And look, maybe you've prayed for that in the past and your sales went down. Maybe you asked God to expand your platform and it feels like it shrunk. But don't give up just because you prayed a prayer and nothing happened. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Just because God hasn't done it now doesn't mean he won't do it ever, right? And it may be, it may be that you're in a season right now where God is getting you ready for your next opportunity. Because listen, listen, obscurity is often the testing ground where God prepares us for the next opportunity. And you may be in that season right now in your life. You may feel invisible right now in your life. Come on, Dad. Some of you may feel invisible. I remember when my kids were little. I'd come home, and my kids, man, they would come running out to the door. They'd jump up in my lap. It was like, Dad's home. You know, it was like, man, it was like a rock show just because I showed up. My kids are teenagers now. I come home. I walk in. Nobody at the door. Nobody around. I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm home. Silence. <laughs> Dad's home. Silence. You know why? Every kid's got their headphones on watching the YouTube. 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 I go in. I'm like, Ethan, I, I pull his headphone on. Hey, buddy, I'm, I'm home. <laughs> Just looks at me like, who are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm home, buddy. Just letting you know I'm home. He's like, mm. headphone back on. It's easy for us in life to feel a little bit invisible. But you know what? In those seasons, don't stop praying for your kids. Don't stop praying for your work. Don't stop asking God to expand your platform. Some of you have kids that have gone off the road, and you're, you're worried about them. And, you know, the person that I'm so grateful for on Father's Day is my own father. And the one thing I'll say about my father, I, I got wrapped up in a four-year drug addiction. I was completely off the road for a, a, a for four-year period in my high school years. But my dad never gave up on me. He never stopped praying for me. He never turned his back on me. He loved me. And so, friends, I don't know what you're praying for, but don't give up on God. Don't give up on what he can do in your life. Don't look. My God can still do miracles. My God is not dead. My God is not dead. And so I want to keep asking, keep seeking, stay hungry. 
Look, in a good season, that's the perfect season to be at church every weekend. In a good season, that's the perfect season to open your Bible regularly. In a good season, that's the perfect season to be intentional about praying. Look, just because you're in shape, that doesn't mean you stop going to the gym. Right? When you're in shape, what do you do? You're in shape, you're like, got to keep it up, baby. Got to keep it up. Got to keep it. I don't want that. I don't want that eight pack. I don't want Pastor David Hughes' eight pack. I don't, I don't want that going down to the two pack. I don't want the keg. And so you keep hitting the gym, even though you're already in shape. And the same is true in our lives spiritually. Stay hungry. Here's another principle. If you want to position yourself to be blessed, and that is not only stay hungry, but stay humble. Stay humble. And humble. Hungry and humble. Stay humble. Now, uh, I got humbled at the gym a while back. I used to go to this uh, old YMCA gym. And it's not one of these new places, LA Fitness, with, you know, like nice screens everywhere and bubble gum and, you know, people, oh, I'm sweating. I got a little towel for my sweat. No, this was like the YMCA. I'm talking about cockroaches. I'm talking about nasty basement. The, bed, the weight room was in the basement, right? You went down the basement, it was silence. All you heard was the hum of the fluorescent lights. You know, there was, there was no TV. There's no, like, surround sound. There's no, like, none of that. And I'd be alone working out around noon. It's this old downtown YMCA. Alone working out around noon. And uh, after a while, there was always this one guy that would come in when I was there. And he was a mean-looking dude. He was a pro weightlifter. He did not look like he wanted to talk to anybody. You know, the vibe guys throw off at the gym, right? That brother's there to work. We're here to do business, right? So I just, I had my little 25s, you know, and I stayed over in the corner. I just tried not to look at him. And I remember one day, he, he looked over at me, he goes, hey, will you spot me on the bench press? And this is not a guy you, you said no to. It's like, you know, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So... He's going for max reps, right? So, so he puts more weight on this bar than I've ever seen anybody put on a bar in my life. He's going to do the bench press, right? He, he loads it up. Now, when you spot somebody, there's, there's a bench and there's, you know, the, 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 the bar and it sits on the bar rest there and he puts all the weight on. And so the guy's laying down, his head's right here. I'm supposed to stand behind him. And as the bar goes down, then it goes up. If he gets in trouble, right, I'm supposed to reach down, keep my back straight. Come on, dads. Use your legs. I get one hand under, one hand hand over, grab the bar, and bring it up. How's my etiquette, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like, I, I've done this before, right? But, it, but I've never seen this much weight in my life, you know? And I'm like, oh my gosh, right? So he goes down, he does one rep, he's just going to max out. He gets about halfway up on his second rep, and he stops, and he says, a little help here. <laughs> and so I remember grabbing this bar. I'm standing right over him. I grab the bar, and I pull. Nothing happens. No lie. <laughs> Nothing. It drops about a quarter inch. He says, little help here. And I pull again, and I pull again, and I pull again. And I can remember the moment to this day. I looked down at his face, and I said, that's all I got. And he looked at me like, I'm going to kill you, white boy. It's, it's about to be over right now. And then he does this. This move, some of you are very experienced weightlifters. You know the move I'm about to describe, right? He does this move that the pros do. The rest of us break a wrist or a rib gauge or something. Because I'm thinking, like, do I, do I run up and tell the people upstairs? At the... <laughs> hold that. Just hold that pose. And I'm standing there, and, and, and he drops his right arm, just completely drops it, and slides over on the bench, lightning speed, where the bar hits the edge of the bench. He's able to keep his left arm up just enough that the weight slides off. And when all the weight slides off that bar, this is where it gets super dangerous, right? Like a million miles an hour, that bar flies up this way. He slides over so that the bar hits the, uh, the bench on this side. All that weight falls off. He stands up and he throws the bar across the gym. And then he turns around and looks at me. And I'm thinking like, it happened in an old YMCA. <laughs> that was where I took my last breath. And he's walking around doing this with his hands. <sighs> and I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, I didn't even know what to do. I just stood there. <laughs> he 
turned around. And he walked up to me, and this was what he said to me. No lie. First words out of his mouth. He goes, we're going to work out together. You know what I said? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. He said, you meet me here same time tomorrow, I'm going to show you how to really spot somebody. So, yes, sir. So we did, man. We worked out together for about three months um, until I had moved from this particular area. But I'd go back to this old YMCA. We met there at noon every day. I'd go down, and it was the most humbling experience of my life. I think this guy, for the next three months, took it out on me that I, that I blew the spot in a moment when he needed it. But, I mean, he'd work me. And then he, he wasn't yet a follower of Jesus, but he found out I was a pastor and a follower of Jesus. And so he would work me in that situation. You know, I'd be, like, maxing out and I would have nothing left, and he'd say, you know, give me seven more if you really love Jesus. <laughs> Do it for Jesus. I'm like, I can't buy it. And, you know, I'm like, and my, I'm like witnessing to this guy. I'm like, oh, oh it's, you're going to go there. Stand back, son. You're about to see the supernatural. I remember at one point he... Uh, at one point, he tells me, like, give me, he says, seven's the perfect number in the Bible. Give me, give me seven more. I'm like, what, what did you Google that? You have no idea what the perfect number in the Bible is. But that was the most humbling thing in my life. I come out of the gym. You ever had this moment? I couldn't lift my hand up to get the key in the ignition of my car. I'm like, you know, you ever had this? I'm like, uh, I'm just trying to get the key in the ignition, right? I remember like at night standing there, Lori's my witness, my wife. I said, Lori, will you help me brush my teeth? Because I could not lift my hand up to brush my teeth. Humbling, humbling. Now I worked out with your pastor, David, at the gym recently, and I'll just say that was a humbling moment as well. He's about just as bad. He ain't, he ain't playing around. No, he was, he's very kind, but he ain't messing around. <laughs> Nicodemus is about to have a humbling moment. He comes to Jesus. It's at night. He's got kind of this whole perspective. And commentators sort of pick up on the fact that Nicodemus in his conversation is sort of wanting to do a little give and take. He's wanting to do a little bit of, hey, you know, um, I can offer you some things, Jesus. I can offer you access and legitimacy. You can give me some sense of your teaching. Here's what Jesus says to him in the midst of this interaction. John chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, commentators note, we just kind of read that, it flies past us. But Jesus is kind of saying, Nick, there's nothing that you can do for me. Sit down, be humble. You want to enter the kingdom of God? You got to be born again. Now, this would have been surprising to Nicodemus. They would have used this phrase, but never for an accomplished, educated, degreed, religious professor. That would have been offensive in many ways to him. He's like, you got to be born again. In other words, you're going to have to humble yourself. It's like saying, Nicodemus, everything you've worked for your entire life, your degrees, your moral perfection, all the things that you've kind of worked out in your life, it's not enough. You got to be born again to get in the kingdom of heaven. This is where we get that phrase. We, we've heard it, uh, you know, the, the phrase, many of you have heard it, to be a born again Christian, right? So what does that mean? Well, it comes from this phrase in John chapter three. It could be translated to be born from above. So Nicodemus is surprised by this whole statement. Check this out, John chapter three, beginning of verse four. This is Nicodemus replies to him, what do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? He's like, hello? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. Jesus is humbling Nicodemus, this incredible accomplished teacher of Israel. And he's saying this only happens through faith, through water and spirit. You must be born again. Now think about that picture. He uses the picture of a newborn baby. I remember when, uh, my, my, when, when my son, uh, Ethan, was born, we were in the delivery room. And I remember the doctor came in and he looks at me and he says, hey, um, would you like to deliver this baby? And she's in labor and the whole deal. And I remember looking at him and I said, no. 
I'm going to stay in my lane as a pastor, and you stay in your lane as a doctor. Don't we like it when people stay in their lanes, right? You know, everybody stay in their lane, and we'll be good. But I looked over at my wife, and I could see the look on her face was like, you got to do this, Judd. And so I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, sure, I'd love to do this. So, so I get all suited up and all of that, and um, I put the gloves on, and I'm standing there, and he put his hands underneath my hands, and I got to deliver, you know, our, our son, Ethan. I got to be the first person to touch him, you know, got to cut the umbilical cord. It was amazing and miraculous. And I remind Ethan when he's being ornery, I'm like, your mother might have brought you into this world, but I delivered you. (laughs) Don't forget it. But that's the picture Jesus uses. Think about, think about a baby when a baby's born in the world. Like what does a baby actually contribute to that process? I mean, helplessness. It's about it, right? And they're just born, and they don't like it very much in the moment. They're yelling, screaming, and it's, you know, all the colors. Everything's different, right? It's like I was having a spa, and what is this? (laughs) Welcome to life. And when you think about salvation, the Bible says salvation is something God did for us through Jesus Christ. We, We don't do anything to earn it or achieve it. We simply receive it as a gift. What we bring to spiritual birth is about the same as what a newborn brings to physical birth, helplessness right? We show up and and we bring helplessness, God brings the help. We bring sin, God brings salvation, right? We bring our shame, God brings his spirit. We bring our pain, God brings his purpose. We bring our brokenness, God brings his healing. We bring our garbage, God brings his glory. God's the one who meets us in that moment and at the what we call the foot of the cross in Christian terms. In other words, that place of faith in our lives where we trust Jesus Christ by faith and what he's done for us. That foot of the cross is equal. It doesn't matter your race, your background, how much money you make, what you drive, how many degrees you have, how much money you have in the bank, how good your golf game is, how your abs look, when the last time you went to the gym was. It doesn't matter who you cheer for on the sports field. It does Look, all that stuff is secondary. What matters is what God has done for you more than what you can do for him. You just receive... So humble yourself. Don't start thinking, you know, my life, I'm being blessed because I'm good. I'm being blessed because I got it all together. I'm being blessed because, you know, I got swag. That's why I'm being blessed. I sing on the worship team, CB Glades. That's why God's blessing me. I serve, I volunteer, I'm on, the, I'm on the camera team. That's why God's blessing me, right? I, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm involved. That's why God, look, look, in, in the end, It's a mystery, God's blessing. We want to stay humble, and we want to stay hungry, and we want to position ourselves in such a way to say, God, bless me and work in my life, and whatever you do, I will give you praise. Chance the rapper. What does he sing? When the the praises go up. Do I need to sing it? When the praises go up. The blessings come down. Right? When the praises go up. Oh. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to spare you before it gets ugly up in here. Right? The blessings come down. We got to stay humble. Every day I carry this coin in my pocket. This is my Celebrate Recovery 29-year sobriety chip. Now, I don't, this 29 years is a long time, right? I don't carry this in my pocket because I'm chained to the past. Yeah, I'm, that's a long time ago, it's another life. Um, I don't carry this because it's convenient, because it's not. Bangs around in my pocket, rubs up against my keys, annoys me. But every night when I go to bed, I take this out of my pocket, and I set it by the sink, and every morning when I get up, you know, I pick it up from the sink and I put it in my pocket. And I do it, because it reminds me of some things that are very important for me. It reminds me that when I was lost, there were people that stood next to me and prayed for me and stood with me. It reminds me that when I'm frustrated with others, no matter what's going on in their life, that they can be redeemed and healed and restored. It reminds me that nobody is outside of the goodness and the grace of God in their life. It humbles me. You know what it says to me? It says, you know why I'm banging around in my pocket? Because it says, Judd, you know better than anybody else. Don't forget it. 
You know better than anybody else. You're just another, and the only difference between you and whatever the worst situation or worst person you can imagine is, is my grace. My grace. Stay humble. Humble people. Humble people don't think less of themselves, but they just think of themselves less. They think more of others. They're more concerned with others. They care more about what God's doing in the lives of others. They want to use their gifts to serve others. Humble yourself and then stay faithful. You want to be blessed? Stay hungry. Stay humble. And then stay faithful. Look at what Galatians says. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24 says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Stay faithful. Follow the Spirit's leading. Look, man, the Spirit's going to, some, some mornings you're going to wake up, so, some evenings you're going to wake up and you're going to think, ah, I don't want to go to church. But you get in your car and you go to church anyway. Because you know the Spirit's saying, yeah, you need to show up. Some mornings you're going to want to, you're going to want to, you're going to know you should pray for somebody, but you don't, you don't really want to pray, but you follow the Spirit's leading. You stay faithful. There are going to be seasons in your life where you're trying to save for a certain purchase in your life, but saving for that purchase is getting in the, in the path of you being generous back to the church and back to God. And you sense God's Spirit's telling you, you need to be faithful over here, but you really want this thing over here. And sometimes you just got to follow the Spirit's leading and say, you know what, I'm just going to be generous, even if it takes longer, and I'll eventually get there. But for now, I'm going to continue to be faithful in this moment in my life. Sometimes people are going to hurt you. They're going to burn you. They're going to do things that, 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 that anger you. And you're going to want to lash out. And you sense the Spirit saying, you got to go on the journey of forgiveness. And so you got to give in to that moment and live a surrendered life. My friend Craig Rochelle says this about being faithful. He says, time is short. My king is coming soon. Because eternity matters, I will give him my all. My faith moves mountains. My prayers calm storms. My words give life. My hands bring healing. My feet deliver the good news that Christ is risen as he is coming again. God's word is a lamp directing my steps. His spirit is my power. When I'm weak, he makes me strong. Because Christ is coming, I will not back down. I will not sell out. I will not be pushed around. My life's too valuable. My calling's too great. My God's too good to waste my life on things that don't last. I'm empowered by God's Spirit. I'm trained by God's Word. I'm tried by fire. My name is written in His book. My life belongs to Him. Because my life is not my own and earth is not my home, I will live for the glory of God and not the applause of people. I'm strong in the Lord and in His mighty power to do His will on earth as it is in heaven. Because Christ lives in me. Listen, trials cannot stop me. People cannot break me. Money cannot buy me. Haters cannot silence me. Demons cannot defeat me because look time is short my king is coming soon no regrets no excuses holding nothing back with his help and by his power listen I will leave no words unsaid no deeds undone no hope unshared because my king is coming soon stay humble stay hungry stay faithful and you position yourself to be blessed. Look, God doesn't just want to partially bless your old life. He wants to bless you with a whole new kind of life. God purposed, God empowered. So friends, on this Father's Day, let's humble ourselves. Maintain those habits in the good season. Because the way you maintain those habits in the good season, that's going to have everything to do with determining how you handle the bad season. If you're being tested right now, look, where God tests you is where he's preparing to bless you. So take hope, don't give up, and don't give in. Let's bow and pray. God, we thank you. We love you for who you are. We thank you for your word that gives us hope and meaning and purpose. And I pray for those who are here today at different places on the spiritual journey. We just pray that you will encourage and uplift, that you'll give hope, that you'll do a work in their lives, a work that only you can do. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.